Now this dirty, dusty old thing is a Digital Equipment Corporation PDP 1105 made in Ireland in about 1973. It's your traditional blinking lights type this console, although I think it's only got one row of lights uh, with toggle switches. The toggle switches toggle up and the momentary ones I don't know, there's one that toggles down and there's one that toggles up, okay? And that one looks a bit... needs a bit dicky. The examine switch. Hmm. It's a worry. Okay, um, as you can see it's pretty dirty. I'll give it a clean up before we have a really good look at it, but just broadly we've got the power supply here, back plane, and the circuit boards. There's a fan here for the power supply, and another fan at the back for the logic. It's been fitted with a Australian 240 volt plug, going into here, I guess there's some sort of EMI in there, wires going off to the transformer, to the fans, to a couple of sockets on the back. Uh, now, you would think, going by the 04 and 05, uh, 04 and 34, which had very thick 5 volt wires going from the power supply to the back plane, you'd think they'd be thicker wires, but they all seem pretty thin, unless there's some that are hidden, but we'll find that out as we go along. I've got to vacuum out all the dust and give this a bit of a clean. And uh, yeah, even though it was made in Ireland, you don't program it in Gaelic, you know, you still got to use Arctal. So, I'll give it a clean and we'll come back. Well, she scrubbed up reasonably well with a bit of brush and vacuuming. Uh, power supply is a bit nicer now. Uh, this area here had dust because it wasn't protected by this board, which I've taken out, the M873YA, but underneath that, this part of the board, of the core memory board, which was covered by this guy, is quite nice and clean. So I'll pull out the other boards and we'll have a look at them. So this is a this first one, M873YA, is I believe a bootstrap board. Looks like it's got a couple of ROMs there with provision for a couple of more. Uh, and that goes to console, does it? Not sure. Documentation on this seems a bit thinner, but I've got a lot of um, I've got a lot of schematics for this in the catacombs, so I should be able to find out what that stuff is, but I haven't dug it out yet. Front's a bit a bit cleaner now. Uh, okay, I'll lift it up and pull out these other boards. Okay, out comes this core board, which doesn't have levers. Okay. So, it's part of the core memory and actual core planes are there. This is a third party thing I believe, probably from Plessy. I've got another thing like this. Yeah, Plessy. 8K by 16 core memory. Okay. Next cat off the rank. Huh. Where does that go? Hmm. And we've got a tear in there. So this is very stiff and crunched. Don't know where that used to go. Um, but it's clearly cactus. We've got a tear there, so probably needing replacing. Uh, just wonder where the hell it went. Anyway, this I believe is also part of the core memory. A G231. Uh, 
again, couldn't find much on them online, but presumably I'll have more in the documentation out in the other room. Uh, this was, I think it was called data loops in what I saw. Next, also I think part of the core memory. delay on there. Um, yeah, pretty sure this is core memory. This is a another G module, a G110. Yeah, got to, got to do some digging to find out more about these core memory boards. And then we have the CPU, which is a two board job, like the 1134. It has a control board, which is this one. M7261. What are these big guys? 74154, four line to 16, 16 line decoder, demultiplexes. And the last board, M7260. This is the data paths. Uh, that's for the console. Yeah, what that case? Um, strange chip there. I think that's a UART. I think the, uh, yeah, this includes, it's supposed to include a uh, serial interface, I believe. Hmm. Anyway, there's uh, the ALUs, 7481s, four of those, like the other. CPUs in the 04 and 34. Bit of a bodge there. So, where the hell does this go? Just into here? Does it go into that? I guess it has to, doesn't it? We'll find out more as I get into the documentation. Get more cleaning needed. But yeah, this is, uh, hasn't suffered well where it was exposed. It's all right down there, but she'll need a replace. And yeah, that just goes to the front panel. Uh, so I'll vacuum out this and take off the front panel, see what it looks like there. And the front panel, once the four screws here are removed, just pops down like that. Dirty there, so um, I won't dig into that too much further right now. But maybe it doesn't need those two of those wires. But those two wires have been just snipped off there and they're two of the ones that, where that nick in the cable up here is but uh, I think that nick probably cuts three or four wires no I'll just put that back for the moment and try and get the power supply out I think it's this is an H740D power supply and rather I found some uh, online drawings that look like this so I'm guessing that's what it is uh, okay put this back on and try and get the power supply out so I took off the power incoming panel which also includes a circuit breaker so that I could get that off and then two wires going over to the pan there so I'll move those See if we can get the power supply out now. So I haven't looked at my documentation in the other room yet, but I looked at the manual for the PTP 1105, and they describe how to get at this power supply. You don't, you don't get it out the way I was trying. Yeah, if you remove six screws here, the regulator module comes away, and there's connectors on the bottom apparently to all these wires that go out through holes in the in the case of the supply. Um, I don't know if you probably didn't need to take the loosen the supply at all using the four screws at the bottom but at least I was able to get the fan and clean that up a bit. So I'll take out those six screws. Oh and this thing by the way where the power comes in it doesn't have an EMI filter it's just a circuit breaker so no EMI filter by the look of it, unless there's one in here somewhere. 
And this thing apparently is a uh, thermostat that disconnects the AC if the heat sink gets too hot. And six screws are loosened, so removed over. So, uh -huh, as promised, connectors on the bottom. And so, not easy to get at. Why don't they turn it the other way so that, you know, who knows? Well, that doesn't come away easily. There's another connector under there somewhere. Oh. Yeah, connected down there at this end. So, and will that. Looks like you have to take this capacitor cover off as well. And the nut. Okay, finally the regulator comes free. This thing produces uh, plus 5 volts at 17 amps, plus 15 volts at 1 amp, and minus 15 volts at I think 5 amps. So I'll check out the electrolytics on this, make sure they're good, and then I should be able to turn on the power at least. And uh, yeah, a bit of wiggling, this whole box can come out so I can give that a clean as well. And all I need is for this to fit in there, does it? Yes. So I'm able to get away, get this whole box out, and give that a clean. And we can see in here too. Make sure those connections are, are good, nothing loose, and yes, more cleaning needed. More cleaning needed in there as well. Pretty dirty. Mm -hmm. I wonder where he comes from. Yeah, so that's how you get the power supply assembly out. You disconnect this with six screws first, and then and then that loosen that and get all the then you can disconnect all the mate and lock plugs and then you can pull this assembly out. Now before I mentioned that this uh, CPU board has a built-in console interface, a, a serial interface, and I thought it might be this at first, but that's just for the, for the front panel. Uh, if we look down here, we can see there's a, this ribbon cable comes up the bottom this connector will be wired across to pins on the first and second boards the cpu and then it goes out the back to a 40 pin berg connector so that, that's the console interface down there and i may have been a bit vigorous with my brushing and it looks like i've broken this wire off so hopefully that will be easy to work out where it goes and maybe i should take that off and try and fix those wires a bit more permanently maybe maybe with some hot snot just so that they don't break off easily again um yeah so and a bit more cleaning up to do but yeah that's where this serial interface comes from and this fiber washer that i found floating down in there like that came from there so it just separates the regulator module from the power supply case so these three have come off in my uh, manhandling of this thing. So, uh, yeah, I hope I can find out where they, which pins they're supposed to go to. Now, if you're going to be playing with one of these and you want to get this grill off, it's best to take the whole thing out with, with the fan. Don't, don't undo these two screws, just these four out here, because those two just go onto the fan. And one of them was too short. I don't know how it ever fitted in the first place, but I couldn't get the nut back on. It was too short. So I'll keep those as spare and I'll put a couple of M3s there. So that's how to get the fan out and I've given that a clean. The serial cable going to the bird connector down there is held down with some double-sided tape and the bird connector is held down. Oh, sorry, yeah, the PCB for the bird connector is held down by two small screws and um, 
so you need a thin bladed screwdriver, slotted screwdriver and a long one because you have to come in from here and from here uh, and looks like I managed to break off three wires so there's a bit of work trying to work out understand where they came from and either hot glue them or cable tie them together so they don't come off again now I've only got one PDP 1105 computer but I've got two engineering drawings for an 1105 and these are substantially the same I haven't checked that they're identical but uh, when it comes to trying to work out where these three broken wires come from they're no help if we look at the sections relating to that there's no mention here's the that bird connector with the PCB at the back and then the connector here the 20 pin connector that goes to the front of the back plane down there um, no mention of any extraneous wires connecting to the pins on that circuit board and the same with the similar page in the other book so I'm suspecting that this is some sort of a uh, fudge and in fact this set of drawings uh, there's a few notes in this set of drawings like blah 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 that might in pin 22 of you are bridge to something or other um, that may well be pin 22 of the UART bridge to so that's what this bodge is so this is some user modification not even a, done by deck and there was some other things in here yes yeah, so and there's some highlighting and a piece of a note stuck there this data path card is modified by ARL C schematic blah 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 which I haven't looked at yet but that makes me suspect that all this business down here with these things is some sort of a user modification uh, because you know, soldering directly onto the board like that is well, it's pretty dodgy isn't it I'd expect deck to do better than that but uh, so what I may end up doing is simply taping the ends of these and then cable tying them all together so that they don't so that no more break off and uh, just put it down to a user mod some of them go to the bottom board the data paths i think it's the data paths at the bottom uh yes it was and some of them go here to that would be the second slot which may be that 873 m873 board uh, and that's where two of them come from <laughs> uh yeah so I'm just going to take the ends of those up and cable tie them together and forget about them till they become obviously needed because according to these books they don't exist right uh, next thing to do is take out these capacitors and these electrolytics the four big ones and um, try charging them up slowly and see if they hold a charge removing the cover for the capacitors there's a nut used as a spacer between that and the circuit board and for my own reference and for anyone that might be playing along at home let's check out where these capacitors go I think these two are identical 24,000 microfarads 50 volts it's 50 volts it's probably the same we'll check that when we take it out these two are different they're the two crowbar SCRs so the big one that's the 5 volts is this capacitor and he's 6000 microfarads 10 volts so he goes there with this big SCR the plus 15 volt job or is it minus might be minus 15 um, yeah positive goes to ground so this is a minus 15 volt supply uh, here's 3000 microfarads 25 volts goes next to that SCR so we know where those capacitors go and we should also take note of polarities uh, I can't see any plus and minus on these maybe it's on, it will be on the top as well but just in case 
that one with the 5 volts is right and goes there, 10 volts on that side, and this one has that symbol sticking out. These two, I've taken out the terminal bolts, but they're stuck down, and rather than breaking whatever seal that is, I think I'll restore this colour and disconnect these strips that connect to the circuit board, just undo those bolts there, and um, so I can get to the terminals without dis breaking the seal that connects these to the board. So those two are up, and as expected, they've got priority signs there, plus terminals, so should be easy to get them back on. Now having decided to leave those capacitors in place and put that strap back on, uh, I've also put back two terminal bolts and just loosened these so that I could swing the, what do you call them, connectors. Swing those connectors away so uh, I can just play with each capacitor independently or in parallel, doesn't matter. Uh, I suspect they're not in parallel. I think I saw that they were, no, they're not. One's with a minus, with a minus 15 and one's with a plus five. But, uh, one, one of those, the plus five volt supply is 17 amps and the minus 15 is only five amps. So why the same size filter capacitor? I'm not sure. Anyhow, uh, and, and, yeah, the plus five also has to drive the uh, plus 15, so you'd expect a difference in capacitor size. But anyway, uh, and I'll stick the little molly tester onto it and see what they say before I stick any bolts in. Assume they're all discharged. This one should come out as 3000 microfarads. So let's see what the little tester says. Bigger capacitors take longer to test. 3573 microfarads. Well, that's pretty close to 3000. It's a bit high, which often means it's a bad capacitor. Now, I did do a whole lot of recording of capacitor testing and it was starting to waffle on a bit too long so I've discarded that and I'll just give you a summary of what I did. I'm trying to test these four electrolytic, large electrolytic capacitors so, so I first tested them with one of these little multi testers and they all read a bit higher than their than their specified value but within tolerance so you know, they appeared to be okay but the real test is uh, whether or not they can hold a charge. So to do that, I set up this power supply and set it to the to almost the maximum voltage of the capacitor and then charged it via a resistor and selected it so that it would slowly charge the capacitor over about at least two hours so that it, uh, it gave the capacitor a, a gradual exposure to voltage and in the process hopefully reform the electrolyte or whatever the process is that reforms the electrolytics and after a while and, and leave it charged for a while and then the plan was to uh, disconnect the charging and then monitor the voltage on this meter and just let the 10 mega ohm impedance of the meter discharge the capacitor and see that it discharged slowly and uh, I simulated all that in LT Spice where, where I could you know, just instead of doing the calculations just let it work it out for me and it, it would give me a graph showing how the discharge curve and I could see if it was charging appropriately so for instance and I've tested all of them uh, this is the last one it's the negative side filter capacitor uh, now this meter here can't go to, uh, it's, it's rated at 50 volts and I'm charging it to what, about 48, this meter can't go that high so that's what I've got here is a lithium ion phosphate battery pack that I'll put in series with the meter to get more voltage. Uh, and I've had it discharging for a while so it's dropped a bit but 
uh, yeah, in, over a few hours it, it's, it's uh, discharged from 48 to 46, so that capacitor is good. This capacitor also seems good. No, not that one. This one, 3,000 microfarads, 25 volts. That's on the minus 15 volts output. However, this capacitor here, the positive filter capacitor, and this one, the plus 5 volts output capacitor, both appear to be bad. They just don't hold a charge very well. That that number there drops dramatically within within minutes. Uh, I've got to check that all again, make sure I haven't done something dumb, but that seems to be it. The negative side's okay, the positive side is not, and that was the higher current at 17 amps on the plus 5 volts. So that's the one that's experienced the most stress and ripple current. So, uh, yeah, in summary, that's, that's what I did. And I looked for, first thing I saw for a replacement for that was uh, 90 odd dollars, so bugger that. I went looking around in the shed and the closest I can find, 50 volts of that diameter is only 5,500 microfarads, which is not enough. So uh, I'll do some more looking, but I'll probably end up just replacing those with uh, smaller modern capacitors. Even if I have to get a bunch of not screw terminal ones, just with uh, with uh, normal wire leads, maybe get three, like for instance this one, sorry this one, which needs to be 6,000 microfarads. If I just got three 2,200 microfarad, 10 volt, low ESR types and put them in parallel, it, and they'd be a lot smaller. So in parallel and, and clumped together, it'd be similar volume, and hopefully having three in parallel will. Uh, gives a bit more ripple current capability which is why these ones are so big for their size uh, so that, that's it for um, power supply and we'll do a we'll have a closer look at the circuit boards now so all the video you've just watched up until now was recorded and edited about two months ago <laughs> And every day since then I've been meaning to finish this, but I've really lacked motivation. Some of it because I'm just getting a bit sick of these PDPs, I want to get onto other things. And But probably mostly because of the city I love has been turned into a communist gulag, where we've been locked up for 23 hours a day, allowed out for only certain purposes, can't go more than five kilometres from home, curfew from 8pm, and uh, yeah, it doesn't help you motivation but anyway I'm going to try and knock this off now <laughs> so uh, we'll go through the boards because I didn't show them very well when I took them out so we are going to have a better look at them this is part of the CPU there's two boards for that this one's called the data paths so it's got the registers and internal data buses that connect all the data to various parts of the computer like out to, out to the uh, Unibus for memory and I.O. but also through these uh, four arithmetic logic units so uh, they're 74181s, four bits wide so four of them for 16 bits uh, there's also a number of ROMs on here all these ones of numbers are uh, ROMs uh, they're, they don't contain the microcode some of them contain constants that just get enabled onto the data when you need a constant value uh, some of them are part of the microcode decoding, so they, um, out of the instruction register, wherever that is, parts of the, the bits from that will go into these ROMs and they'll output signals that mean certain things for certain instructions. So, haven't dug too far into it, but that's the gist of it. Uh, this here is a UART, so it's, it's not just the data paths, it's got a bit of I.O. on it. That wire there that comes off pin 22 is, is a bodge that I think was added by some user in the past. And looking at the data sheet for the chip, that's the transmit buffer empty indicator. So for some reason they wanted to know that. And that goes into one of these down here, probably, probably is. Yeah, it's probably that wire there. And goes out to nowhere at the moment. But as I said before, I'm just going to 
take those over and cable tie them and forget about them unless they become important somewhere. Now you would think that this 40 pin connector which goes to the which goes to the console via that cable you'd think 16 of those would be used for the LEDs and somehow multiplex to also pick up the switches but that's not how it works in fact the LEDs are driven serially there's a shift register on there so this thing outputs one data bit along with a clock bit which goes into a shift register to load the LEDs and this chip here is a 74150 16 to one line multiplexer and that's used to gate the appropriate bit onto that data line as required to build the serial data that goes into the shift register there so a bit strange I would have thought multiplexing the 16 bits in parallel would be easily accomplished with 40 pins to play with but nah. so yeah that's, that's the plumbing the data and it's all that's all controlled all the uh, chips that are enabled onto the internal data buses and out to the uh, unibus etc are all controlled by the other half of the CPU the control board which oh, this is by the way the M7260 and on this board here for the UART it needs a board rate generator which is over here uh, there's a trim pot to get the fr frequency right and a switch that selects uh, one of five different board rates. It's actually ten positions, but five of them aren't used. Now, that, all those data paths have to be enabled into the, all the various places that they can go to and be picked up from, and that's what the control board does. So on here, you'd think there'd be some ROMs. I can't see any. Oh, yeah. These here are ROMs. Uh, look, I'll have a look and see what that is. Yeah, so maybe, maybe there's a bit more of, on the other board. The um, all these ones of numbers that are ROMs. So, but some of it's decoding uh, micro instructions. Maybe, maybe a lot of that, the control function is actually there as well. Maybe the data paths more here. But yeah, there's at least two there. They're probably ROMs. I'll have a look and see what these big chips are. You know, these guys are just 74154, uh, 4 to 16 line decoders. This is just another ROM. In fact, there's quite a few ROMs there that don't have numbers like these two. There's a number of ROMs there, so presumably that's the microcode. And the rest of it's all pretty much Garden 7400 stuff. So that's the CPU, those two boards. Right, the next three boards are the memory subsystem, which together is called an MM11L. And this particular one happens to have a third party memory module from Plessy. But uh, if the DEC version would have a uh, H213 or H214, that's 4K and 8K. I've got a couple of them floating around somewhere, but. Uh, yeah, which would be about the size of these things. They're, they're quad boards, the H213 and 214, but this one's got not only that, but all this electronics as well. And I think I may have a manual for this, but if there's something wrong in there, bloody hell, how hard is that going to be to fix? Anyway, uh, and then that's controlled by the other two boards. So the boards that control the core are this one, which is a G110, called Control and Data Loops. Uh, are they the loops? Who knows? Um, there's a delay line there. But once again, if there's something wrong on there, uh, it might be a mongrel to debug. And finally, the G231 uh, memory driver doesn't look quite as daunting as the other two but still I hope there's nothing wrong with it all that needs to wait for the power supply to be fixed um, I may I'm not sure if I gave the number for that power supply before 
and I may have got it wrong, but it's a H750. And part of doing all this, part of pulling this thing apart, I thought I was just to have a look inside, was to try and find a connector like that that I can use to upgrade this dummy load for when I do get the capacitors for that power supply I want to be able to use this dummy load to test it and I'm going to do the same thing to find out what sort of connectors for two PDP-8s I've got which will be in future videos um, but I'll mostly be opening them showing the boards like I did here and finding out what sort of connector it's got so that I can use this dummy load for it and the last board is the M7, uh, sorry, M873YA, uh, which is the restart loader. It's got two ROMs with optional room for two more. That's 128K, 128 words. You can make it 256. And from what I can gather, these ROMs contain bootloaders for various devices and this connector here has four active pins which can be used to select which device is to be used to boot from, I think. Uh, that, that directs it into the appropriate location within these ROMs. Now these ROMs have a fixed location in memory and these four banks of diodes can be used to change where these ROMs appear for each of the four devices. So you can snip away diodes and that'll change the address that is selected for each one of those four. So they'll be placed in different memory, but none of them are cut, it's just living at the standard addresses. At least that's my understanding of this thing. Um, and the schematics also mentioned a M930 board, which is just a little short ass terminator, just two, two things wide. I've shown them in other videos, just a bunch of termination. Uh, it wasn't in here, but I've got a pile of them anyway, so that shouldn't be a problem. So, that's uh, that's it for this thing, I think, uh, until I get around to playing with it some more when I've got replacement capacitors. I can test the power supply and gingerly power it up. Uh, I hope that core memory is working. Otherwise, I've got MOS memory that I can put in place of it, but it'd be nice to have the core working. Uh, yeah, so, sorry it took so long, <laughs> catch you later.